When we look at the history of English literature, the Anglo-Saxon or the Old English period is really significant. It's clear that from the very earliest period itself, that is from the 5th century onwards, the migration of Celts and Gaels happened in Britain and Romans, they also tried for a repeated inventions. For example, Julius Caesar in 55 BC and Claudius in 180, their inventions in this place were successful. Their military presence, then the camps were rooted in this place. Also, the implications such as their native belief, that is the paganism, was replaced by Christianity and St. Augustine converted King Ethelbert into Christianity in 587 AD. Later, another group of Germanic invaders called Visigoths, they attacked Rome and thus Romans were forced to withdraw from this place and by AD 407, Romans left and thus Britons became defenseless. As England is defenseless, they were under attack of Pitts and Scots, another group. And during this time, Another group of Germanic tribes called Angles, Saxons and Jutes, they arrived from the eastern coast of Europe to defend against these Pits and Scots. They actually came in order to help the Celts, the native inhabitants. But when they understood that the England is fertile for agriculture and more safer than Europe, they tried to dominate this place and as a result, these Celts, who were the original inhabitants of England, get displaced and they settled into settled in uh, Cornwall, Wales, Ireland and Scotland. Also, this Angles, Saxons and Jutes, here the Jutes are less in number and they also get displaced eventually. And this Angles and Saxons, they became the domain power. So, as we heard that Jutes, Angles and Saxons who in the middle of the 5th century left their homes on the shore of the North Sea and the Baltic in order to conquer and colonize distant Britain. The meaning of their names in the old Saxon word ankul or onkul means hook and the English verb ankul is used invariably by Walton and other writers in the sense of fishing. So the first ankles uh, as hookmen, possibly because of the fishing, more probably because the shore where they lived at the foot of peninsula of Jutland was bent in the shape of a fish hook. Then the name Saxon from Sax, a short sword, which means the sword man. And from the name, we may judge something of the temper of the hardy fighters who preceded the ankles into Britain. And we know that the Angles were the most numerous of the conquering tribes. And from them, the new home was called Anglerland. By gradual change, changes, this became the first Inglerland and then England. So the name England came from Angles land. The name Anglo-Saxon was first used in the national sense by the scholar called, called William Camden in his history of Britain and since then it has been in general use among English writers. So the name Anglo-Saxon was first used in a nationalistic sense by the scholar called William Camden in his book called History of Britain. When we look at Anglo-Saxon literature it's clear that there were no printing press at that time and most of the works were lost due to oral transmission as it was the age of oral literature. Also, there were only few number of prose and poems and the main themes of those poems were about religion, war and daily life. Also, in this period we can see a very little scientific and cultural advancement in literature. Beowulf is the famous epic of this period and the author is unknown and we can estimate that it may be written by some Christian because we can see the, uh, the elements of Christian religion in this epic. The story of Beowulf goes like this. At a time when the Spear Danes, here Spear Danes is the country or the nation where without a king 
a ship came sailing into the harbor. It was filled with treasures and weapons of war, and in the midst of these warlike things was a baby sleeping. No man sailed the ship. It came of itself, bringing the child whose name was Skyld. Now Skyld grew and became a mighty warrior and led the Spear Danes for many years and was their king. Later, this Skyld died, and one of the Skyld's descendants was Hrothgar, king of the Danes, and with him the story of Herbjolf begins. Hrothgar, in his old age, had built near the sea a mid hall called Herod, the most splendid hall in the whole world, where the king and his thanes gathered mightily to feast and to listen to the songs of his gleeman. One night, as they were all sleeping, a frightful monster called Grendel, who broke into the hall, killed thirty of the sleeping warriors and carried off their bodies to devour them in his lair under the sea. So here, the Grendel is the monster. So later, the Beowulf, who was a young hero who was in the house of his uncle called King Hygelac, he heard about this monster called Grendel and he wanted to meet him. And later he met this monster and he killed this monster. And later he also killed this monster's mother, whom also tried to attack Beowulf and his people. So here Beowulf killed this monster called Grendel and later his mother. So he became the king of Spear Danes. Later in his old age, again a dragon called Fire Drake. Fire Drake tried to attack this people of Spear Danes, but now our hero Beowulf is very old, which is a short poem, rather a song. It records the experience and sensations of a traveler who has wandered much. Witsith or the fall wanderer has traveled widely among different tribes and races and come across different tribal chiefs and princely rulers. The wanderer gives a list of the tribal princes with whom he was acquainted and who had given him rich presents. Some of these princes like King of the Goths, Attila, King of the Huns and Alboin, King of the Lombards are historical figures. The poet also describes the rituals and the social manners and customs of different primitive people. And also the poet of the Vitsith is unknown. And it is a valuable piece of the social documents of primitive life and times in Britain, no doubt for it. The poem Dior is much more poetic than Vitsith and is the one perfect lyric of the Anglo-Saxon period. The poem is arranged in trophies and it has 42 lines in total. It gives a glimpse of the famous figures in Germanic legends and also it is the combination of the themes with a personal elegic theme which were not common in Anglo-Saxon poetry. The fight at Finsburg is also an important poem of the spirit. This poem is a fragment of 50 lines which were discovered on the inside of a piece of parchment drawn over the wooden covers of a book of homilies. It is a magnificent war song which describes Hainov, a Spanish leader with his 60 warriors who were attacking against Finn and the fight lasts for five days but unfortunately the fragment of the poem ends before we learn about the outcome. So the poem is incomplete. Then Waldir is also an important poem this poem is a fragment of two leaves from which we get only a glimpse of the story of Valdir and his bride called Hildgund who were hostages at the court of Attila. This same story was written in Latin in the 10th century. So we came to know that the ancestors, these Anglo-Saxons, were familiar with the legends and poetry of other Germanic peoples also. Then there is another poem called Seafarer. Here also the poet is unknown and this poem is divided into two distinct parts where the first part shows the hardships of ocean life and the second part is an allegory in which the troubles of the seaman are symbolized as the troubles of the human life and also the call of the ocean symbolizes as the call of the God or call of the soul to be up and away to its true home with God. 
the other poems which have a perfect lyric uh, for example the wife's complaint and the husband's message these two poems have a perfect lyric when we look at the life of anglo saxons we get to know that they were really fond of sea in beowulf ellen there are 15 names for describing sea and in all their poetry there is a magnificent sense of lordship over the wild sea even in its hour of tempest and fury in their works we can see five common principles that were their love of personal freedom their responsiveness to nature their religion their reverence for womanhood and their struggle for glory as a ruling motive also the first speech begins with a song of witsid and deor so first recorded speech begins with the songs of witsid and deor and we can see that these speeches is teutonic in its origin then coming to the famous northumbrian literature we get to know that there were two great schools of christian influence came into england the first of these under the leadership of agustin who came from rome and it spread in the south and the center of england especially in the kingdom of essex it founded schools and partially educated the rough people but it produced no lasting literature and then the other under the leadership of the saintly aidan who came from ireland the monks of the school labored chiefly in northumbria and to their influence we owe all that is best in anglo-saxon literature it is called the northumbrian school and its center was the monasteries and abbeys such as jarrow and whitby and its three greatest names three greatest figures are saint bede cadman and canewulf coming to bede has also known as the venerable bede whose life span is 673 to 735 he is known as the father of english learning he wrote almost exclusively in latin and his last work is the translation of the gospel of john into anglo-saxon also ecclesiastical history of the english people is also his one of the famous work in his ecclesiastical history we can see the life of cadmon He is also another part of Anglo-Saxon period. It is believed that Cairmon received the wisdom from God and when he was awakened from the enlightenment, he remembered the words of the hymn which was given by God and he added more to it. Later, he met Hilda who was in the monastery of Whitby and she made him to repeat the hymn. to the monks the hymn he had composed and all agreed that the grace of god was upon cadmon to test his grace they asked him to make poetry from the scriptures of the bible and he went away humbly and returned in the morning with an excellent poem thereupon hilda received him and his family into the monastery and made him one of the superior among them and also she commanded the whole course of bible to him he in return reflecting upon what he had heard transformed it into most delightful poetry and by echoing it back to the monks in more melodious sounds and he made everyone as his listeners coming to cadmon's works the greatest work attributed to cadmon is the paraphrase the paraphrase is the story of genesis exodus and a part of daniel from the bible and we can see uh, beats assured that cadmon transformed the whole course of bible history into most delightful poetry but we don't have such evidences to prove that uh, assurance we can see uh, the paraphrase the book opens with a hymn of praise and then tells the story the fall of saturn and his rebel angels from heaven after recounting the story of paradise the fall and the deluge the paraphrase is continued in the exodus of which the poet makes a novel epic by rushing on with a sweep of an anglo-saxon army to battle besides uh, the work paraphrase 
we have a few fragments of the same general character which are attributed to the school of Cædmon. Uh, the longest of these is Judith, in which the story of Judith, who cuts off the head of Holofernes, a savage and cruel Viking. Here, the hero is the Judith, and we can see her mighty glory and fame. Then we have the famous figure whose name is Cainavulf, who lived in 8th century. The only signed poems of Cainavulf are The Christ, Juliana, The Fates of the Apostles, and Eleni. Unsigned poems attributed to him or his school are Andreas, The Phoenix, The Dream of the Root, The Descent into Hell, Good Luck, The Wanderer, and some of the riddles. Of all these works, the most characteristic is undoubtedly the Christ, which is a didactic poem in three parts. The first part celebrating the nativity of Jesus Christ, the second is about his ascension, and the third is about doomsday, which totally telling the torments of the wicked and the unending joy of the redeemed. We can see that Cain of Wolf takes his subject matter partly from the church liturgy but more largely from the homilies of Gregory the Great. His work, Andreas, which was an unsigned poem, which was an unsigned poem in which we can see the records of the story of St. Andrew who crosses the sea to rescue his comrade St. Matthew from the cannibals. And in the story, a young shipmaster who sails the boat turns out to be Christ in disguise. So, at the end, we can see Matthew is set free and the savages, the cruel savages, are converted by a miracle. So, no doubt, it is a spirited poem, uh, full of fresh and incident. And we can see the descriptions of the sea are the best in Anglo-Saxon poetry. Then, another signed poem of Cana Wolf, that is Elena, has its story of finding the true cross. Here the root means nothing but the cross of Christ. So in Elena, it tells of Constantine's vision of the root, that is the cross of Christ, on the eve of battle. After Constantine's uh, victory under the new emblem, he sends his mother Helen to Jerusalem in search of the original cross and the nails. So the poem is dealing with finding Jesus Christ's cross. Another significant feature of this period is some books called Exeter Book and Versailly Book. Here Exeter Book is found in Exeter Cathedral and the book is a collection of Anglo-Saxon poems presented by Bishop Leo Frick during the circa uh, 1050 and the book Versailly which was discovered in the monastery of Versailly which is in Italy during 1822. The only known manuscript of Beolf was discovered circa 1600 and is now in the Cotton Library of the British Museum. All these are fragmentary copies and it shows the marks of fire and of hard usage. In the Exeter book, it contains the Anglo-Saxon poems and works such as The Christ, Good Luck, The Phoenix, Juliana, Witsith, The Seafarer, Dio's Lament, The Wife's Complaint, The Lover's Message, 95 Riddles and many short hymns and fragment and no doubt it is an astonishing variety for a single manuscript. Coming to Anglo-Saxon prose, the Anglo-Saxon prose begins in the reign of King Alfred the Great who was the king of West Saxon during the time 871 AD to 899. He was a patron of literature and a warrior. During this time, there were many struggles in this land with Northmen, and these struggles were ended with the Treaty of Wedmore in 1878 with the establishment of Alfred not only as a king of Wessex but as overlord of the whole northern country. And later in the literature, he supervised translations and he instituted the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which was a chronicle with a continuous record year by year of important events happened in England. 
so the king alfred first to put the vernacular to a systematic use and his important translations are four in number one oratius universal history and geography which was the leading work in general history of for several centuries then he translated bede's history which was the first great historical work written on english soil then he translated pope gregory's shepherd's book which was intended specially for the clergy and he translated boethius consolations of philosophy which was the favorite philosophical work of middle ages more important than any translation is the english or saxon chronicle this is probably at first a dry record especially of important births and deaths in the west saxon kingdom here the king alfred enlarged this record beginning the story with caesar's conquest so through this saxon chronicle he elaborated the record he elaborated the events happened in that land during those times the king was also against the dane law and he united all the kingdoms of southern england against the vikings because viking inventions happened two times in this land the first one happened in 787 ad and the second one happened in the 866 ad so king alfred united all the kingdoms of southern england against the vikings and he styled himself as the king of the anglo-saxons by 166 ad the battle of stamford happened and in less than 3 weeks the normans started to attack thus england defeated by the battle of hastings so by 1066 AD Norman conquest also occurred in the same land under the William the Conqueror and William of Normandy arise from the Normandy the France in the Kent so uh, Harold Godwinson the last Anglo-Saxon king also get defeated thus the Norman conquest happened and the Anglo-Saxon domain get ended so then begins anglo norman period in short the main features of anglo saxon literature were some of the important features where they used uh, plenty of accent and alliteration and an abrupt break in the middle of each line which gave their poetry a kind of martial rhythm then northumbrian literature and its influence is very significant in this anglo saxon period the northumbrian literature which flourished between 650 and 850 ad and in the year of 867 this northumbria was conquered by the danes and who destroyed the monasteries and the libraries containing our earliest literature so most of the literature most of the important works were get destroyed by the danes and then when king alfred who came and who started the english prose and he started to collect and arrange the remaining piece of works and he started to recollect it and preserve it also he made the saxon chronicle which was revised and enlarged by alfred and which was continued for more than two centuries so it is the oldest historical record known to any european nation in its own tongue The main dialects used in this period as four one is northumbrian which was first to produce literature then mercian then kentish and west saxon even though there is not a printing press machine or such things they used to transfer the oral literature they had so when we look at this literature today we can get to know about how the ancestors their life and the style and period which marks the beginning of history of english literature